Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome. Welcome to another lesson for tonight. We're going to be working on class number six, and we are going to be, um, well, learning about a few things. Um, something specific that we're going to be working on is going to be a conversation that deals with um, possible solutions, you know, to a problem. I think many of you have already seen it and have an idea of how the conversation goes. Apart from that, we are going to be talking about infinitive clauses and phrases. Um, how can we defer an infinitive clause and a phrase? Then um, it is very likely that we are also going to be talking about would we'll rather that is used normally for, um, well, when we talk about um, preferences and how we are going to be dealing with questions of choice, mainly with questions of choice. When we talk about questions of choice, it means that uh, we're going to be talking about questions that have um, two options in them, and then you have to pick the one that suits your preferences better and uh, will help you or will serve as a better um, suit for you and uh, you know the specific decision that you are making at a specific time so yeah that is going to be part or a big part of what we're going to be working on um then we also um sorry okay let me see one second because i'm having problems with my camera right now Okay, let's see if it works now. Well, uh, it seems like I'm going to be having issues this uh, evening with my camera, so I probably will not be able to, um, well, to be with my camera on because yes, it's not letting me turn my camera on for tonight. Well, that is not going to be a problem. Um, Okay, thank you for Goches and uh, Miguel who are letting me know that you guys are not going to be able to participate in the lesson as well. Thank you very much. All right, so apart from that, apart from, uh, well, talking about questions of choice, the conversation and all that, um, we also have the activity for the beginning of the lesson, which is, well, the, the question for today. <clears throat> now, the question that we're going to be dealing with is going to start with the regular or the more regular questions that I like to ask um, for these classes. Because those questions go into a more personal uh, or go into the, a more personal background and um, relate to you and your lives. So that is basically what we are going to be working with tonight. Um, so yeah. Let me see. Estoy tratando de resolver esto, pero aparentemente hoy sí nos vamos a quedar sin cámara. Because, yes, it's not allowing me. <clears throat> well, sad about that. All right. So, um, let's get started. For tonight, we're going to start with that, with the activity of asking or the, the question, you know, that I normally ask. And uh, it's going to be something easy for today. And uh, we're going to be talking about food and about your favorite food. All right. But the one thing that I want to clarify is that this space is not only for you to simply answer. If I ask you, for example, what's your favorite food? You simply ask, answer, sorry, pupusas. And uh, you do not provide any further explanation to the question. The idea is that you get to practice as much and uh, that you also provide an explanation. For example, if you are ever asked a question, a very simple question or uh, an of course, an open-ended question, um, like, what is your favorite food? That's the example I just gave you. The idea is for you to provide more explanation. Like you say, I like pizza because it has an amazing um, flavor when it mixes the cheese, um, the sauces, and also the, I don't know, pepperoni or any specific meat that you like to put on top. So that's the idea behind it, you know, that you practice, not only that you go ahead and simply use one or two words and then you're done and you call it a day just with that. So the idea is, as I said, that we have as much practice as possible 
and uh, the, each of you has at least one minute, you know, to go ahead and practice and explain your um your point of view on the specific question that I'll be asking. So um that basically is what the activity is about, and we're going to start with it um just about now. All right. So the first person that I would like to hear from is going to be Dennis. So tell us, Dennis, in your case, what is your favorite food? Um, I think about it. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't have um a favorite meal, but um, at this time I I I'm gonna say one. Um, I guess the the hamburger. The hamburger, uh, uh, I like so much because it has a great flavor and and always the uh, uh, comes with um fries, and the fries uh, are so delicious. All right, very good. So basically, we're gonna follow the idea that um you like burgers and as, at the same time you also like um fries. So nice, very good. Um, I think burgers are great for many people. Like there are many people in the world that have, you know, burgers as, um, well, their favorite food. And I can totally see why. Me, myself, for a long time, I was also very fond of burgers. When I was younger, I will say that burgers were my favorite food because of the mixture of flavors. You have like, you know, different vegetables in it. You have meat in it. You also have bread in it. And there is also the side dish, as you mentioned, you know, the fries. So basically a burger has a little bit of everything and the mixture of flavors makes it an amazing dish. But very good. Thank you very much for sharing. All right, let's move on. Let's hear now about Jenny. How about you, Jenny? What will be your favorite meal? Good evening, teacher. Um, I like to eat the... You can say roast beef. Um, roast beef. Yes, roast beef. Mm -hmm. I like roast beef. All right, very good. And why would that be? ¿Por qué nos gusta la carne asada? Mm. <laughs> because it's, it's uh, uh, how do you say it? Rica and delicious and delicious. Tasty or delicious? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's not necessary to have like a big idea or a big answer behind that. Um, so yes, just by saying that it's delicious, it's okay. So um, yeah, roast beef is also one of those, you know, common things that um um that uh sorry. Un minuto. Estoy simplemente aquí dialogando con corporativo. Un minuto. Ok. Ok, sorry. Lo que pasa es que como es un inconveniente, ¿verdad? Que la cámara esté apagada, eh, más que todo de mi lado, pues me están preguntando o, o consultando el por qué no, no la puedo encender y pues yo les dije que no, no estoy seguro el por qué, porque estaba encendida al principio, pero pues luego falló, ¿verdad? Pero bueno, eh, creo que ya eso más o menos quedará aclarado. Um, so yeah, well, as I was saying, roast beef is tasty and uh, yeah, I have an experience with it. When I was you know, younger, um, what, like six years ago, I would like to eat roast beef um, very, very well cooked. I don't know if you guys know about that. Like in, in restaurants, normally when they sell a steak, which is, well, a very similar cut, of, a more refined cuts of meat, if we are going to, to call it that, 
um, they ask you for what is specific. Yes, very good, Dennis. So they ask you for what specific term you want on your beef or on your meat. Um, so mm -hmm. before I had the experience of being an intern or being on the internship that I had and uh, go to the United States, I will always eat my meat well done, like as well done as possible. Casi, casi carbonizada, verdad? I, I used to have my meat like that. I, I used to love it like that. But then when I got there, it was basically the first time I went to a restaurant, like a speci uh, like a nice restaurant. Um, we went to a steakhouse. And uh, the mom that I used to live with, the, 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 the mother in the house, she was Peruvian. So she was Latin American. She knew how Latin Americans go about that, about the, meat, the, the beef or the meat, and how we normally have it well done. So she was like, um, I recommend you to have it well done. Because it's your first time at a steakhouse. As you go, you know, or continue to live this experience, I will advise you to move into more risky decisions. Like, for example, asking it for three quarters or even you can ask it as medium rare. Esos son los tres más comunes. Hay steakhouses que tienen cinco eh, términos para la carne, pero lo más común son tres, ¿verdad? Está en el well done, que es el bien cocida, que también se, se usa aquí. Tres cuartos y el um, corte medio, que es básicamente en inglés se refiere a eso como medium rare, que significa pues medio cruda, ¿verdad? Entonces, sí. eh, pero aquí yo siento que es, es extraño. Yo, si les soy sincero, la carne que compro acá, acá, yo no le confío hacerla así, porque tengo miedo, ¿verdad? De que no salga tan buena. Pero, eh, I, I like, uh, for me, I like uh, three quarters. Ajá. Uh -huh. But um, La Pampa and Pino, uh -huh. uh, the, the meal arachera is very delicious. Oh, okay. The one I had from La Pampa is, um, I don't remember. I think it was Bife, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. I don't remember well. The other day, I also tried one that they call... Oh, I forgot the name. It's a very common cut in Argentina. But the thing is that I normally, I now normally ask for medium rare, as Dennis said, because I feel like you can feel, you know, the, the taste of the meat even better um, with that. But <clears throat> it's, you know, depending on, on your taste and how risky you want to go. But for those who have never tried it, for those who have never, you know, tried meat um, three quarters, I totally recommend you to do it because um, they gave me my they gave me that advice before. They advised me to try three quarters, and I did. And trust me, it changed my life because now it's it's way better. Like whenever I have the chance to have beef, and I you know go to those restaurants, I enjoy having it like that. Either even um or either three quarters or uh, medium rare because yeah, it's it's very very delicious to have meat like that. But very good. Nice. Very nice. Thank you very much for sharing. All right. Let's move on. Let's hear now from uh, Andrea. How about you, Andrea? What is your favorite food? Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my favorite food is uh, the pasta, the, the food, the Italian food. Mm, it's okay. very delicious for me. <laughs> Do you have any specific pasta or any specific uh, variant of pasta that you like? Yes, the carbonara. Oh, all right. Very good. Do you know how to make it or do you only order for it? Uh, only, right? only it. <laughs> okay. I, I don't, I don't make it. I don't show make. <laughs> okay. Have you ever tried making Alfredo? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, because Alfredo is, is yeah. easier. Alfredo yeah. is something easier to make, yeah. Carbonara, I have only seen videos on how they prepare it. I think I have never even tried carbonara, but it yeah. looks like an amazing um, way of having pasta. But yeah, pastas are also, you know, a great, a great, great, great meal. Um, some of my favorites also, but yeah, very good. Thank you very much for sharing. All right, let's move on. Let's hear from Nadia. How about you, Nadia? What is your favorite meat? Oh, sorry, your favorite food. Okay, hi everyone. My favorite food is uh, sea food. And I love many, many food, fruits um, and vegetable. I like very much. I like much. 
All right. Very good. Great. Yeah, sometimes, you know, having a healthier approach on food also provides us nutrients and benefits on the healthy option or when we go to talk about the well-being of our bodies. So also following those options is always great. Um, so nice. Thank you for sharing. How about the case of uh, Daisy? What is your favorite food? Good evening, teacher. Good evening. Okay. Uh, I love Indian chicken soup. Mm, really? Because uh, my mom makes it. All right. And, uh, I also like seafood, uh, especially shrimp. Shrimps? Shrimps. 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 Uh -huh. Esa es una palabra complicada. Shrimps, los camarones. Very nice. Talking about Indian food. Um, I think I have never tried Indian soup. What I have tried is chicken tikka masala, which is like an Indian curry. And uh, I don't know. Have you ever tried tikka masala, Daisy? No. No? Oh, okay. Well, tikka masala is like a very spicy well indians cook with a lot of spices but tikka masala is like a very very spicy chicken that is cooked on coconut milk on regular milk and also a mixture of vegetables like a ton of vegetables you have onions in there you have tomatoes peppers um a little bit of everything so it's a spicy sometimes it's hot it depends on where or how you you ask for it And it's normally served with white rice. But when I say white, I mean white, okay? You don't even add tomatoes to it because normally, you know, we like to have our rice with um, with something in it, you know, like a little color, we say. We like to add carrots or something. Um, but tikka masala is served with plain white rice because the, the beef, I mean, the, the, the chicken itself and the sauce that it comes with has all the flavor. So if you ever, you know, come into liking the idea, look it up because there are tons of videos on Google that show you how to prepare it. And uh, yeah, I think it's an amazing way of having chicken. So very good. Thank you very much for sharing. Already yeah. then. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes, Daisy. Sorry. It's amazing. Yeah, it sounds like, a, I mean... I have tried it a few times and I can tell you that it's a very delicious dish. So um, talking about what we're going to be dealing with tonight, I told you about this guys later. Um, we are going to be, well, dealing with a conversation that um, was basically left over from yesterday class. And um, in this conversation, as I said, we're going to basically be wrapping up the topic about problems we're not going to be dealing with problems anymore we're going to move into a different thing after thing sorry after this um conversation so for he, the development of the conversation we have two people being included into it we have carla and we also have andy the title for it is what can we do now how should the conversation go well it should sound as following um look at all those dead fish What do you think happened? Well, there's a factory outside town that's pumping chemicals into the river. How can we do that? Isn't that against the law? Yes, it is. But a lot of companies ignore those laws. That's terrible. What can we do about it? Well, one thing to do about it is to talk to the company's management. What if that doesn't work? Well, Then, another way to stop them is to get a TV station to run a story on it. Yes, companies hate bad publicity. By the way, what's the name of this company? It's called Apex Industries. Oh no, my uncle is one of the top executives. All right, so as you guys can see, in this conversation, we're going to be dealing with a problem, as I said, that is being caused by a company's misuse or, um, <clears throat> sorry, misdisposal of, uh, well, the chemicals that they produce or that they use for their proper function. So uh, I would like to have now two volunteers to help us practice the conversation and show the rest how we're going to do it. So two 
uh, participants, please, who will, okay, Nadia, and who would like to join Nadia on the practice? Me, teacher. Um, sorry, who said me? Oh, Giselle. All right. So, Nadia and Giselle. Very good. So, uh, when you're ready, you may start the practice. Yes, I am Carla. Um, look at look all those dead fish. What do you think happening? Well, there is factory outside town that's pumping chemical into the right. How can they do that? How can they do that? Is that again the law? Yes, it is. But a lot of companies ignore that law. That's terrible. What can we do about it? Well, one thing to do about it is to, to talk to the company's managers. What if that doesn't work? Well, then another way to stop them is to get a TV station to run a story on it. Yes, company hate bad publicity. By the way, what what's the name of this company? It's called Apex Industries. Oh no, my uncle is one of the of the their top exec executives. Executives. <laughs> executives. I. All right, very good. So um, we have some points here once again where we can use uh, the well-known and well-mentioned linking sounds. Sí, una vez más, tenemos aquí otra oportunidad para practicar eso, ¿verdad? En la primera línea, básicamente, iniciamos con ello. Sí, look at all. Aquí, en lugar de decir eso que está tan trabajado, el decir look at all, podemos decir look at all, look at all. Look at all those dead fish. Sí, look at all those dead fish. Así se, se va a sonar mucho, mucho, mucho más sencillo, ¿verdad? En lugar de decir look at all, podemos decir look at all. Sí, look at all. Esto, como les digo, no es una utilización incorrecta del idioma. Simplemente es una adaptación que se hace para poder eh, pronunciar de forma más efectiva algunas frases que de lo contrario fuesen frases bastante trabadas, ¿verdad? Si yo dijera look at all those dead fish, esa sería la pronunciación correcta. En cambio, si yo digo look at all, estoy sonando mucho más natural y además estoy diciendo la frase tal y como debería ser. Look at all those dead fish. What do you think happened? Sí, iniciamos básicamente, ¿verdad? Viendo un problema y la persona, en este caso Carla, pregunta, what do you think happened? ¿Qué crees que pasó? Luego, pues, Andy parece tener una respuesta en he says, well, there's a factory outside town. Aquí esta frase, outside town, en algunos casos, eh, pueda que ustedes se la encuentren así, miren, outside of town. Pero esto de la utilización del of estaba quedando bastante desfasada. Hoy en día no es tan común que se utilice. Pero habrá producciones like series or movies from the 80s or so where they will say something like that, outside of town. Es bastante común que en, digamos, en, en presentaciones, en, en conversaciones previas, como ya de los ochentas, se vea bastante que diga outside of town. Pero hoy en día es más común que solo se diga outside town. So, there is a factory outside town that's pumping chemicals into the river. Entonces, eh, esta podría ser otra opción, ¿verdad? Otro momento en el cual podemos utilizar los linking sounds. Into the river. Sí, into the river. En lugar de solo decir into the river, into the river, into the river. So chemicals into the river. Um, then we have, uh, how can they do that? Isn't, aquí esto, recordar que es una eh, pregunta negativa, sí. O sea, la, 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 la forma en la cual la pregunta está siendo creada es de forma negativa, pero básicamente lo que estamos queriendo saber es que nosotros sabemos que eso está mal. Normalmente lo utilizamos, ¿verdad?, cuando eh, estamos hablando acerca de situaciones que son malas. Entonces, en este caso tenemos eso. Isn't that against the law? Um, a ver, eh, Dennis, tell me. Uh, yes, I got a question. Uh, would it be okay if we say, look at all instead, look at all? Uh, say it again, please. 
will be okay if we say look at all instead look at all. Yes, yes. It's basically, it's very similar. The, the idea behind the linking sounds is that you, you know, adapt oh, the yeah. phrases. You adapt the phrases into something that works for you. So yes, the saying look at all, um, it sounds very British because it does sound very British, but it is acceptable as well. Uh, it's very acceptable. The look at all okay. is more um, like an American version, an, an Americanized version. But look at all is also uh, functional for this specific phrase. All right. So uh, here, as I was saying, when we have these negative questions, what we refer to, ah, yo sigo haciendo señas aquí como si tuviera la cámara encendida. So when you, you talk about um, these negative sentences or negative questions, is basically what you do is that you want to have a answer that either confirms or denies your proposition. That is because it's also a yes, no question, okay? These ones are sometimes known as tag questions as well. Tag questions are the ones that we use uh, with phrases like, for example, um, you tell someone, you're going to the party, right? That question at the end, when you say right, that is what we're going to know as the tag question. So here, when we use these negative uh, ways of asking the questions, we're going to be basically going for that, you know, going for um, an idea or like an idea that we already have, but at the same time, we just want to confirm is, is that idea, if that idea is okay or is correct. So isn't that against the law? She already knows or she already has like an idea that this is against the law, but she wants to make sure that it is. Then the answer comes from Andy and he says, yes, it is. But a lot of companies ignore those laws. You know, as, as I always say, when you uh, provide a positive, positive um, answer to a question, it's always important that you try to add a comment afterwards. That, um, for example, here he says, yes, it is. And then he adds the comment. He says, but a lot of companies ignore those laws. So there you have it. You know, it, you're um, basically making the conversation continue with that comment after the answer. If you simply say, yes, it is, it's like a dry answer. And there is not much to add when um, the other person gets that answer. It's like, ah, okay. Just simply say, yes, it is. And it's only taken as, as in Spanish, someone, somebody will tell you, see. Sí. Nada más. O sea, ustedes le dicen, ¿verdad? Eh, no, es, no, es, no está eso en contra de, la, de las leyes. Entonces, si él solo les dice sí. Básicamente, la conversación, o sea, ahí como que llega a un punto muerto. Como que no hay más que se pueda eh, seguir hablando, ¿verdad? Al respecto, porque es como que, bueno, ok, sí, ya que. Entonces, por eso siempre, yo se, se los juro que siempre les voy a aconsejar que cuando tengamos la oportunidad de eh, tener estas yes, no questions, tratemos de agregar un comentario, ¿sí? Algo que haga que produzca que la conversación pueda continuar. Un comentario claramente referido, ¿verdad?, al tema. No vamos a contestar algo, eh, pues, referido a esto de las leyes y digamos, yes, I like listening to Cardi B. O sea, algo que esté completamente fuera del tema. No ese es el punto, sino un comentario que venga referido también al tema, ¿verdad? All right. Then we have the continuation here. It's a, a reaction from her. She says, that's terrible. What can we do about it? Then she's worried about it. She would like to have like a, a, a possibility to help, something to do about the situation. And he simply answers that, um, well, one thing to do, um, one thing to do about it, sorry. Here, this phrase is a little bit weird because from my perspective, I think that over here, we should have a coma. Okay, but... If we see it from the grammatical point of view, there is no need for a comma. But from my perspective, I feel like a comma is needed here. And uh, I will also advise you to make a stop there. You say one thing to do about it, then you continue. One thing to do about it is to talk to the company's management. Okay, so very simple, right? Um, then we have, what if that doesn't work? These questions, the what if questions are the um, conditional questions. When we talk about conditionals, we're talking about basically the idea that something may not work. So what are we going to do if that doesn't work? ¿Qué vamos a hacer, verdad? Si eso no funciona. Entonces, normalmente, las what if questions vienen poniendo una posibilidad. Entonces, es como lo principal que 
que se presenta con las what if questions. Sí, una posibilidad. Like, for example, um, you say, what if you go to the movies tonight? Es una posibilidad. ¿Qué pasa si, o sea, qué pasa si vamos, o qué tal si, sí, qué tal si vamos al cine hoy? O hoy en la noche. So, what if? Um, so, yes, in this case, the, the what if question is, what if that doesn't work? O sea, ¿qué hacemos si eso no funciona? Then the answer is, well, then another way to stop them is to get a TV station. Aquí se fijan, esto, another way to stop them. Another way to stop them, sí, es otra vez, ¿verdad? Tratando de hacer una simplificación entre las palabras. En lugar de decir another way to stop them, decimos another way to stop them. Another way to stop them is to get a TV station. Y esta es otra, run a story. Sí, run a story on it. Run a story on it. Entonces, es otra vez, como les dije, no es algo que se van a encontrar solo una vez, sino que ustedes por todos lados van a ver que hay palabras pequeñas que funcionan bien con la siguiente. ¿Aquí por qué se da eso? Principalmente porque tenemos una consonante que luego va a conectarse con una vocal, luego se conecta con otra consonante, luego tenemos una que si bien es cierto es una consonante, tiene un sonido bastante vocálico, y luego una vocal, y luego una consonante con otra vocal. Entonces es muy sencillo el decir run a story on it, sí, run a story on it, en lugar de decir run a story on it, ¿verdad? Sino que run a story on it, sí, eso suena mucho más fluido y bastante natural también. Then we have the finish of the conversation. Yes, companies hate bad publicity. She says, by the way, once again, this phrase was in a previous conversation. And when we use it, when we say by the way, is when we're going to add Um, something that is not necessarily following the same line of conversation. Importante que recordemos eso. Cuando decimos by the way, normalmente estamos eh, cambiando un poco el sentido, ¿verdad? De la conversación. Utilizamos by the way cuando vamos a hablar acerca de algo que desvía un poco la idea de la conversación. So, by the way, what's the name of this company? ¿Sí? ¿Cuál es el nombre de esta compañía? Very simple. Uh, and then... He answers, it's, it's called Apex Industries. It's called Apex Industries. And she replies, oh no, my uncle is one of their top executives. Esa palabra, sí, executives, se refiere básicamente como a los ejecutivos, ¿verdad? A las personas, pues, importantes, digamos, en la, en la compañía. So, oh no, my uncle is one of their top executives. Sí, executives. Muy bien. Bueno, vamos a regresar a esto en un momento. Ya ahorita, pues, básicamente tenemos desglosada, ¿verdad? La composición de la conversación y algunos de los, de los puntos de interés, algunas de las palabras a tomar en cuenta. Now we're going to move into this. Infinity classes and phrases. When we talk about infinity classes, it's very simple. We're going to be looking at verbs like this. This over here. So these are the infinity classes. Obviamente el infinity clause es todo lo que está alrededor, no solamente es ese, ese es el verb clause nada más, pero todo esto sería un infinity clause. Pero porque nos referimos a esto como infinity clause es porque tenemos aquí un verbo, ¿sí? Que está acompañado de la partícula to y esto lo, has, lo convierte en un infinito, infinitivo, perdón, en un verbo infinitivo. Entonces, no es un gerundio. La vez anterior hablábamos un poco acerca de los gerundios y cómo funcionan, y en este caso vemos los infinitivos. Los infinitivos lo que tienen es que eh, simplifican el trabajo, ¿sí? Son más sencillos de utilizar que los gerundios y además los utilizamos en situaciones en las cuales estamos tratando de os, obtener una, una, una opinión o también cuando estamos dando una opinión, ¿sí? Una opinión o un consejo también. Es muy común que se utilicen en esos casos. No son los únicos, o sea, son formas de los verbos que se van a utilizar muy a menudo, pero estos son específicos, ¿verdad?, para este tema. Entonces, tenemos one thing, sí, aquí tenemos esto, por eso les digo que es como un consejo o una opinión, ¿verdad?, que yo estoy dando. One thing to do about it, aquí sería muy difícil o muy raro que ustedes digan one thing doing about it, sí, eso sería bien extraño. Por eso es que cuando estemos dando consejos, es mejor utilizar los infinitivos. Por eso decimos, one thing to do about it is to talk. Y una vez más, aquí tenemos otro infinitivo. Esto es algo bien extraño y por eso es que les digo que normalmente se hace cuando tenemos eh, consejos de por medio. Porque por lo general estaríamos utilizando aquí 
ya sea el verbo base o tal vez un gerundio o alguna conjugación diferente, ¿verdad? Pero como es un consejo, vamos casi como quedando paso por paso y para eso son muy, muy útiles los infinitivos. Muy bien. Entonces, one thing to do about it is to talk to the company's management, ¿sí? Tenemos dos infinitivos aquí, sería to do and to talk. So one thing to do about it is to talk to the company's management. Then, another way, it's uh, otra forma de poder agregar, ¿verdad? Un comentario o un consejo, porque esta sería principalmente después que se ha agregado un comentario. Digamos que estamos en una reunión y alguien ya dio su punto de vista, ¿verdad? Estamos tratando de resolver, por ejemplo, qué hacer en una actividad específica. So someone said, um, I think we could go to the park. You know, that's just a, uh, an idea. I think we could go to the park to have the party. Then you may add another thing or another way, dependiendo del contexto. Um, in this case, it, I think it, we will go with another thing better. Another thing we, we could do is go to a conference room, you know. It's a more close um, location and we will have more privacy. So you are also putting your um, your ideas in front. But the thing here is that you're also introducing um, another idea. So here it's uh, for this thing because we're, we're talking about like different ways in which we're going to to attack, let's say, or to put it a spotlight onto the company. Here we have another way. Entonces sería otra forma, ¿verdad? La primera es una, esta es otra forma. So another way to stop them is to get a TV station to run a story. Sí, it's to get a TV station to run a story. Entonces, eh, este, bien importante, el tomar en cuenta que cuando utilizamos el another way, también es una forma de dar un consejo, una opinión. Entonces, y pues ahí lo tenemos, ¿verdad? Then we have the last one. The last one refers to when we have heard different options, different opinions. Um, let's say that somebody started the conversation. Somebody said, you know, that um, you could go to the park and that's okay. Then somebody else said another thing to do or another thing to consider is going or is to go to a conference room. And then you come up with the one that you consider to be the best idea. Now, one thing that is important is that um, here you may get into trouble. Sí, a esta frase puede meterlos en problemas. ¿Por qué? Importante es recordar que normalmente cuando no queremos sonar rudos o no queremos sonar groseros con esta frase, utilizar plurales en esto y además también facilitar dos o más opiniones, ¿verdad? Porque si ustedes dicen, por ejemplo, the best way, en una discusión grupal, y ustedes dicen the best way to do something, significa que ustedes están poniendo su idea como la mejor idea. Ahora, si ustedes ocupan un lugar de liderazgo y están eh, a cargo de tomar una decisión, pues en ese caso no hay problema. O sea, se deja como un poco de lado de la idea que ustedes están siendo groseros con los demás. Pero si ustedes están dentro del grupo tratando de facilitar o tener la conversación acerca de lo que se va a hacer, lo mejor si ustedes usan, llegan a un punto donde utilicen esta frase será utilizarla en plural. Sí, no decir the best way, sino the best ways. The best ways, in this case, we're going to talk about something that is very tricky. Um, the best ways to fight HIV or AIDS are... Um, to do more research and educate people. So here you have two different options that are being presented. To do more research and educate people. Um, yes, Nadia. Teacher, please, can you repeat in the singular form this last sentence, please? Thank yes. You. So in singular, it will be the best way. Okay, so when you use that one, it would mean that you're putting that as, like, if, as I said, if you have a leadership, um, what, a leadership position in, in that meeting, you can, of course, choose which one is, to your opinion, the best option or the best opinion. But if you're, like, a colleague or a co-worker, it's kind of rude that you will say that. 
because if you say the best way to um to have this party let's say the best way to have this party is to go to the beach so you're saying that that is the best way and that is what you should do and putting your opinion on top of everyone else's opinion when you have a position like that it's way better that you continue using another way see another way instead of saying the best way porque esta es básicamente cuando estamos hablando ya de la mejor forma, ¿verdad? Aquí porque de, es de las mejores formas, sí, las mejores formas, the best ways. Y pues eh, luego continúa y agrega al final, sí, ¿verdad? Dos formas distintas. Um, following the same topic or the same example that we came following before, we could say something like the best ways to celebrate this um, party. Sorry. One second. Sorry, I was I was coughing. All right. So um you say the best ways to celebrate this party are going to the beach and renting a ranch there. Sí, o sea, serían dos cosas que vienen similares y básicamente eh, eso no suena rudo porque ustedes simplemente, o sea, están presentando cuáles son sus opiniones eh, desde su perspectiva. Ok. Pero si lo hacemos, si nosotros lo dijésemos solo en forma singular, ahí sí. Y por eso les digo, algunas cositas como estas eh, son en las que a veces nos vamos a tener que fijar, ¿verdad? Para no meternos en problemas y para que además nuestras conversaciones funcionen de mejor manera. Entonces, eh, bueno, no sé si tenemos alguna duda en cómo se van a utilizar los infinitivos o al menos estos infinitivos. Bueno, tal parece que no, entonces. Solamente el No, teacher. Okay. So, only the reminder that when we use these infinitives, we are normally going to be using them in the first sentence and also in the second sentence or in the second section of the sentence. Already then, let's move into the questions of choice and the intonation, the different intonation that exists with the questions of choice. So, As I was saying at the beginning of the class, when we talk about questions of choice, we're going to be dealing with a question that includes two different options or normally three options, but no more than three, because if you add more than three options, well, it's better that you provide a list instead of asking it in the question itself. Um, it would be much better that you provide a list of options. But here, the questions of choice normally are going to request information from you and uh, are going to allow you to pick what do you prefer to have. Um, so for the first one is, would you, rather to t would you rather take broadcasting or economics? Would you rather take broadcasting or economics? Something to consider and something to take into consideration when we talk about these um, questions of choice is the fact that here, you have the first option. With the first option, the intonation is going to go up. Okay, so you're going to say broadcasting or economics. With the second option, or let's make, let's make it clear, the last option, because as I said before, we may have three options. So the first and second, in the case that we have three different options in the question, the first and second are going to be rising intonations that means that you're going to pronounce them with a strong voice okay you're going to say broadcasting or economics okay so when we get to the last option we're going to lower our, our voices and finish on a lower voice so that is something very specific of the questions of choice because many many questions normally um the yes no questions are going to end on the rising intonation. The ones that normally end on falling intonation are going to be the open-ended questions. But when we have these questions of choice, even though they are normally um, considered just no questions because they basically just offer you the answers, um, they're going to end on, you know, on that idea, on a falling intonation. So if we continue to hear or to practice this, We're going to see that, for example, the second uh, example we have here will sound something like, would you rather study fashion or hospitality? So you hear it, fashion 
or hospitality. So you're going down in your pronunciation and also in the voice level. Let's go to the third uh, example. We have, would you prefer to play the guitar or the violin? So the guitar or the violin. You have a stronger voice on the guitar and a way smaller or um, softer voice on the violin. And then the last example we have is going to sound or should sound something like, do you prefer to study in the day or at night? In the day or at night. So, podríamos decir que cuando estamos hablando acerca de estas questions of choice, el, la primera opción que mencionamos la vamos a, men a decir con alegría y la segunda con un poco de tristeza para que quede, digamos, un poco más sencillo, ¿verdad? La idea de cómo lo vamos a hacer. Pero ahora, quisiera escuchar a algunos de ustedes cómo pronunciamos estos ejemplos. No tenemos muchos, así que será fácil, ¿verdad? Um, solo que quisiera cambiar algo. A ver, aquí quisiera agregar una más. Um, the guitar, the piano, or the violin. One second. Okay, tell me, Nadia. I read the exercise, teacher. Cool, very good. So, um, let's see if you could do... Let's hear all of them. Let's see how you do with all of them. Go ahead. You may start now. Okay. Would you rather take a broadcasting or economics? Would you rather study fashion or hospitality? Would you prefer to play the guitar, piano, or the violin? Do you prefer to study in the day or the night? Very good. You did very, very nice. Thank you very much. Good. All right. Let's hear someone else. How about we hear from Maritza? Okay. Would you rather take broadcasting or economics? Would you rather study fashion or hospitality? Would you prefer to play the guitar, the piano, or the violin? Do you prefer to study in the day or at night? Nice. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. All right. How about we hear now from Arriving? Okay. Uh, go you rather take broadcasting or economics? Go you rather study fashion or hospitality? Would you prefer to play the guitar, the piano, or the violin? Do you prefer to study in the day or at night? All right. Only one thing, Arivin. The idea is to lower the voice on the last option. See? ¿sí? Básicamente ir un poco más suave, ¿verdad? En la última opción. Y son, sonó bastante, o sea, la pronunciación estuvo perfecta, pero sonó bastante plano. O sea, como la misma pronunciación, digamos, en todas. Eh, la idea es como, por ejemplo, que suena la broadcasting o economics, ¿sí? Entonces, es como de bajar un poquito más en, en la última opción. But the rest of it was great, okay? The reading was great, only just lower a little bit more your voice when you get to the um, to the last option. Very nice. Well done. Now, how about Thanks, we... Sorry, hear... teacher. Yes. No, it's okay. It's okay. No problem. Though. You don't need to apologize. Um, how about we hear from Iris? <clears throat> Um, do you write take broadcasting or economic? Uh, I have the question, teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you, I don't know, La Rayita, I don't know. If uh -huh. that is more alone. Eh, va, cuando está así, hacia arriba, significa que es, eh, es como con su vida, ¿verdad? En la pronunciación, sí, broadcasting. Y luego oh, cuando está así, eh, del otro lado, hacia abajo, entonces sería bajando el, la pronunciación, economics, sí, broadcasting economics. or economics. Ajá. Ajá. Llegando al final, como que suene más suavecito. La última, ¿verdad? Cuando decimos mix, que suene suave, sí, broadcasting or economics. Economics, uh -huh. ok. Okay. Would you rather take broadcasting or economics? Mm -hmm. Would you rather study fashion or hospital or hospital? Hospitality. Hospitality. Mm -hmm. Would you prefer to play the guitar or the piano 
or the violin or violin violin violin, violin. Mm -hmm. do you prefer to study it in do you prefer to study in the day or the or the night all right very nice nice that's the idea you know that when we get to the last uh, piece of the word we are going to say last syllable we're going to say it on a, on a lower lower voice so on the day or at night nice very good bueno creo que este ejercicio verdad es bastante bueno es son cosas que a veces eh, será necesario que regresemos a revisar pues para re, re, grabar esa esa práctica por otro lado es también importante recordar que las questions of choice son bastante comunes. Sí, encontramos estas por todos lados casi. Cuando ustedes están preguntándole a alguien, por ejemplo, a la hora del almuerzo, si prefiere que le pongan frijoles o huevos, o si no, si vamos a salir, ¿verdad? Prefieren ir a la playa o la montaña. Entonces, casi que en muchas situaciones vamos a estar utilizando questions of choice. Por lo tanto, será importante recordar, ¿verdad? Este pequeño cambio que vamos a hacer en la pronunciación. Esto no cambia mucho, no es como que va a cambiar el significado de la oración, sino que simplemente es un consejo de entonación, de pronunciación, que ayuda a que la pregunta sea como más welcoming, como más eh, acogedora, digamos. En cambio, si ustedes la presentan, broadcasting or economics, suena como bastante fuerte al final, lo que hace que la pregunta suene un poco fuerte también. Entonces... Eh, a lo que ayuda más que todo es a eso, ¿verdad? A que la pregunta suene más suave, suene más um, acogedora, como dije anteriormente. Jenny, tell me. Ok, I have a question, teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what is the difference in when you use rather or prefer? Ok, when you use rather or prefer, um, they have a very similar meaning. When you use prefer is normally for like more superficial preferences. Like for example, at this moment, what is what you want to do? Now, when we talk about rather, we're talking about more like deeper decisions. Okay, when we talk about rather is when we're talking about something is um, something important, something that can change a lot. Uh, but here, when we talk about prefer, is something superficial, something that is not as important. Um, if, if you see it, for example, that we say rather take, esto estamos hablando de una clase, ¿verdad? Si quieres tomar transmisión o economía, entonces significa que es algo importante para la carrera de esta persona. Por otro lado, si prefieres estudiar um, <coughs> fashion o, eh, qué sé yo, moda o eh, hospitality, que en este caso se va a referir a lo que conocemos nosotros como hostelería, hostelería ¿sí? Uh -huh. Entonces... Eh, es algo más importante que simplemente decidir en el momento, ¿verdad? Would you prefer to play the guitar, the piano, or the violin? Se supone que las, la persona a la que le están preguntando puede tocar pues todos esos instrumentos. Así que simplemente es la preferencia de ahorita. ¿Qué prefieres hacer en este momento? Eh, ¿Qué instrumento tocarías, digamos? O sea, que es algo más... trivial, digamos. ¿Hola? Más trivial, digamos. Ajá, es algo más trivial. No es algo tan, tan importante. Entonces, en cambio, el rather... Es para cosas más importantes, cosas más, like, deeper. Ahora, no significa que no se puede usar rather con las otras, eh, con las otras decisiones, pero prefer no es tan común que se use en decisiones importantes. Sí, el okay, prefer, okay. you're very welcome. El prefer normalmente se queda reservado para decisiones así triviales. Así como la de último, el último ejemplo. Well, do you prefer to study in the day or at night? O sea, esto no va a generar un gran cambio en la vida de la persona. Simplemente lo que hace es que trata de averiguar, ¿verdad? ¿Cuál es la preferencia de la persona? Si prefiere estudiar en el día o si, perdón, si prefiere estudiar en la noche. Entonces, ajá. Muy bien. Bueno, creo que para la práctica de la conversación ya no vamos a tener mucho tiempo. Así que mejor vamos a seguir con lo siguiente. Y mañana va a ser la conversación lo primero que estemos desarrollando. Y aquí tenemos, ¿verdad? Ok. So, uh, would rather take space uh, form of the verb. Normally, uh, yeah, it's something that... Um, this is more taken from a grammatical standpoint. Sí, esto es más desde el punto de vista gramatical, no necesariamente desde el punto de vista del uso de la, de la palabra. Ok sino que es más en cuestión de gramática, ¿verdad? No lo que acabo de explicar, sino que esto es el cómo lo vamos a escribir, básicamente, las oraciones con cada uno de ellos. 
Okay, so would rather um, takes the base form of the verb and would prefer usually takes an infinitive. Entonces, esto significa que con el rather no hay necesidad. Si ustedes se fijaron al principio, en la primera vez que estaba leyendo la oración, yo cometí el error de decir rather to, ¿sí? Eh, perdón, en esta de acá, would you rather to take? Pero luego, pues me fijé que no estaba el to, ¿verdad? Y pues me retracté de eso. Entonces, ¿por qué el rather se queda simplemente con la forma base del verbo. El rather no usa el infinitivo, no necesita colocar esta partícula allí en el medio. Con el rather simplemente vamos a decir, I would rather watch a movie than soccer. Significa, ¿verdad?, eh, que no necesitamos agregar aquí este, esta partícula. En cambio, con prefer, sí. Prefer necesita más... Eh, <coughs> necesita más ayuda para poder funcionar al lado del verbo. Ambos son verbos, no significa que el rather no es un verbo, pero eh, tiene esa característica distinta a prefer. Sí, rather no utiliza el to, en cambio, prefer sí. O si lo vamos a ver desde el otro lado, significará que rather utiliza la forma base del verbo. Sé que eso es un poquito más complicado de entender a veces, eh, pero rather utiliza la forma base del verbo y prefer utiliza un infinitivo, que es básicamente de lo que estuvimos hablando también al principio de la clase. Both are followed by not in the negative form. Like, for example, if we're talking about a negative statement, here will, it will say, I would rather not watch a movie than soccer. So it means that this person um, would prefer <clears throat> to watch soccer. Okay. So we say the first thing, the one that is right next to the negative um, portion of, this, of the, of the uh, uh, sentence is going to be the one that receives the negative also the negative meaning. So here, the thing is that this person will not rather to watch a movie. They will rather to watch soccer. Eso es lo que vamos a entender en esta oración. Son oraciones complejas por eso, porque a veces, ¿verdad? Eh, nos pueden confundir en ese sentido. Porque aquí dice, ¿verdad? I would rather not watch a movie than soccer. Pero esto es porque la negación, similar a cómo funciona el pasado. Yo sé que con ustedes no he, no he hablado acerca del pasado, pero si lo recuerdan, cuando utilizamos preguntas o negaciones en pasado y utilizamos el auxiliar do, que en pasado es did, ¿verdad? Eh, suele pasar que nosotros decimos, did you watch? Y ahí muchos se preguntan, ¿y por qué no dice did you watch con ed? O sea, porque estamos hablando del pasado. Es porque el verbo, el primer verbo que se encuentra en la oración, se queda con el cargo del pasado. Significa que en ese caso, ya que did es un verbo, aunque sea un verbo auxiliar, pero es un verbo después de todo, eh, ya, utilizó, ya fue utilizado en pasado, ahí se queda, digamos, la, la situación de utilizar el pasado. Aquí, la negación se queda con el primer verbo también. Tenemos, I would rather not watch a movie. Entonces, aquí se queda la negación, ¿verdad? Que no quiero ver la película, pero después del then, tenemos otra posible acción, ¿sí? which will be watching soccer. Obviamente no vamos a caer en el error de, de repetir el verbo, o sea, de, de poner el verbo en, en diferentes ocasiones, sino que solamente voy a decir, ¿verdad? Dan soccer y se va a sobreentender que entonces sí preferí, eh, o más bien prefiero eh, ver fútbol que ver una película. Y es bastante similar como funciona en prefer. O sea, la única diferencia de prefer es esta, ¿verdad? Que tiene aquí el, la utilización del infinitivo, pero el not va justo después de prefer. Y la oración se leería de la siguiente forma. I would prefer not to watch a movie than soccer. Sí, I would prefer not to watch a movie than soccer. Entonces preferiría no ver una película que no ver eh, fútbol, ¿verdad? Entonces estamos hablando como de que si me ponen a elegir, yo prefiero no ver una película, pero siempre ver fútbol. So, yeah. Um, of course, you guys can use it in different aspects. Like, for example, here we can change this verb for, oh, sorry, for eat. I would rather not eat a uh, pizza than pupusas. All right. Significa que entonces yo preferiría no comerme una pizza que pupusas. Entonces, elijo antes comer pupusas que pizza. Sí, I would rather not eat pizza or a pizza than pupusas. Um, and here you can say, for example, I would rather not to dance um, <clears throat> pop than bachata, let's say. 
So I would rather not to dance pop than bachata. Preferiría no bailar pop que bachata. Significa que ustedes prefieren bailar bachata porque es el que está más alejado de la negación y es el que recibe, ¿verdad? Eh, básicamente la idea de que es como su preferencia final. Ok, esos son los ejemplos. No son cosas tomadas de mi vida porque no bailo nada. All right, so um, thank you guys very much. That is basically it for tonight. Um, so I'm sorry that I didn't have my camera on. It was just an issue. You guys, the ones who were early here saw that I had it on. But then, you know, things happen sometimes with technology. Hopefully tomorrow that's going to be solved. Um, so for now, all I have to do is basically thank you guys very much for your attention and participation in this evening's class. I hope tomorrow we get to practice the conversation. We also get to have, well, more information, more learning. And uh, yeah, basically that's it. So thank you very much. Have a really good night and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for See you now. tomorrow. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. 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 Bye.